As we're here today, um, Professor Amirav's desire for change, together with his forward-thinking perspectives, um, and he's been really forward-thinking since 1967 when Jerusalem was united. Um, if you have a chance to look him, see the things he's done, I won't go into detail. Um, but he's always been at the forefront of, of um, positive uh, ways to deal with the situation in Jerusalem. Um, I think he offers an alternative to this understanding that this, the conflict is intractable. Um, I know it's very easy to get a little bit uh, depressed sometimes when you see what's going on in Israel and seeing what's going on in Jerusalem. But I do think Moshe offers us alternatives, and I think that's the best thing um, that he can do. And I look forward to hearing his lecture today about the Jerusalem Syndrome. So please welcome uh, Professor Moshe Amirov. Read the Bible. And I'm sure you read all of the Bible. It's uh, called Ir Shalom in Hebrew, the city of peace. But actually, there is no other city in the world who had so many wars. I counted about 37 wars here. Even before the Hebrews, the, the Israelis were here, the Canaanites. And this city saw more blood shed and more wars than any other city in the world. And it's called the city of peace, Yerushalayim. But uh, I would like to tell you more than that on the, uh, I would say, the feeling of Palestinians, Israelis, Jews for that matter, and uh, Christians to this city. One of the most interesting uh, lectures I gave, I give quite a lot of lectures all over the world, but the most interesting one was one day when the King of Morocco invited me to give a lecture in uh, Morocco, in his palace, to a conference, which is called the Conference of the Muslim Organization Countries. But if you know, there is 52 Muslim <coughs> countries, and all of them have a kind of organization and the whole conference was on, a, on the issue of Jerusalem. So me as an expert, although I am a Jew, Israeli, they invited me to give a lecture there. It was a big honor for me and uh, also a kind of uh, excitement. I was never standing in front of such an audience of heads of states, foreign ministers, from Indonesia to Tunisia, Egypt, Palestinians. I mean, I'm sitting there as I sit here and I get a lecture about Jerusalem, and they have to be very careful. So I started to tell them that actually Jerusalem is not a political phenomenon, it's a story. And the story that people tell is what makes Jerusalem so important for them. And the story as a story, as you know, doesn't have to be true, it can be interesting, it doesn't have to be true. So what is your story, I say to them? You have a story about Muhammad, your prophet, who came to Jerusalem, you know, with the angel at night, and came to Temple Mount. And you actually show his footsteps on Temple Mount. And uh, since then, it became important for the Islam, two billion Muslims. But actually, it's a story. You know that Muhammad was never here. We, we uh, scholars, we know it. And this, when I say, I see that the more I speak about Muhammad, they are getting white in their faces. Look at this uh, Israeli Jew speaking about the Prophet. And they say, yes, it doesn't matter if Muhammad was here or he didn't. What matters is that every child, a Muslim child, knows this story and feels toward Jerusalem because the prophet was here. So the facts are not important in Jerusalem. And in order to make them feel better, I say, but we have another story here. You know, when you go, and some of you have been to the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus Christ, you've heard about Jesus Christ, was buried. He was not buried there. It's a story. He was a Jew. He couldn't be buried in the city. He was buried outside of the city. We don't know where, but definitely not in the place where 
millions of Christians are showing this is his place. It's not his place. He was never there. It doesn't matter. Because the children, Christian children, this is what they are grown up on. This is their story. You can take this story from them. Don't confuse them with the facts. And sometimes, if you go to the wailing wall, my wailing wall, a Kotel Amaravi, you see near the Kotel people are standing and crying and touching the, the wall. I was standing there in 1967, touching the wall, crying. This is the last remain of the temple, they say. Bullshit, it's not the remain of the temple. It had nothing to do with the temple. It was even not built by a Jew. It was built by a Roman emperor. It is just holding the mountain. On the top of the mountain, it used to be a temple. But it doesn't matter if you will say to one of the Jews who were praying there, touching the cotton wood, crying, he will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so here you have three stories that uh, three faiths are believing and uh, I'm even not trying to change their mind about it. And I would be stupid to tell them that archaeology says this and from the scholarship uh, way of looking at it, it was not exactly like the bullshit. The story in this city is more important than the facts. So when we come to a political solution here, you have the story, and you have the memories, and you have God here. And, uh, you know, in my academic uh, life I was uh, into conflicts, so I went to see all the places. I think all the places where they have conflicts I've been there. I mean, uh, you know, Nicosia, and Belfast, and you name it. And uh, in Nicosia, I was even trying to kind of uh, mediate between the Turks and the Greeks, you know, they still are in a kind of uh, situation of a conflict. But in all these places, I've never seen a place like Jerusalem. I mean, the, uh, the conflict here is on so many levels that they don't have it in Belfast. I mean, the course I was giving, some of my students are here, I told them about the difference between the conflict in other cities and the conflict in Jerusalem. And in this conflict what matters is really the fact that this city touches the heart of so many people. They take it personally. So this city, of course, knew the Canaanites and all kinds of people who conquered it. A lot of blood was shed here. And the question remains, how do we bring peace? Is it possible to bring peace to this uh, city? In my book that uh, I wrote uh, a few years ago, I am trying to analyze not only the complexity uh, of the city, but also ways to think on the solution. I'll come to it uh, soon. But I wrote the book after a very interesting, another experience I had with Jerusalem which was in Camp David 2000, where I went as an assistant to the Prime Minister of Barak. I was in charge of a group who prepared the blueprints for possible solution in Jerusalem. And in this uh, meeting, we didn't come with peace out of it. I came with a book out of it, but Barak didn't come with peace. I analyzed actually why we couldn't reach peace in Camp David and uh, what are the possibilities to have peace in this city and the Palestinians for that matter they are exactly like us their national movement started with our national movement started they had the same dreams they have refugees all over the world actually most Palestinians are refugees mm -hmm. so we here can have a confederation of two countries like in Europe. We can have a metropolitan shared by Palestinians and Israelis. Even this city can be one city with two municipalities. No border. So they asked me how are they going to define where are we in uh, the Palestinian Jerusalem or in the Israeli Jerusalem. I say go to Tel Aviv and see the border between Tel Aviv and uh, Bnei Brak, or Tel Aviv and uh, what are the cities near Tel Aviv, Holon. 
no border. We don't need a border in Jerusalem. If it's peace, if it's a peace situation like in Europe, we don't need a border in Jerusalem. Of course, we have signs that will tell you after this sign, it's Palestinian Jerusalem. And in Temple Mount, we can find this uh, formula that uh, Faisal and me agreed on, which is the formula of sovereignty for God. No Palestinian form sovereignty whatsoever. No Israeli sovereignty. So this is a dream. So I'm happy you came to hear my dream. It might be that it will never happen. But this is the only dream we can dream here. Those who are really interested in peace. There are other Israelis who had the dream of great Israel. There are Palestinians who have the dream of great Palestine. I met these Palestinians who say, you Jews, you don't have any place here. You go wherever you are. You came from Russia, Moshe, you go there. One big state, a Palestinian state, both sides of the Jordan. Actually, they want Jordan too. I don't know if you know. <laughs> Ask Abdallah, the king of Jordan. He will tell you. He's not afraid of the Israelis. He's afraid of the Palestinians, which are a majority in Jordan. So everybody is afraid here in the Middle East. So let's not be afraid. Let's be courageous enough to go with new ideas. We are strong enough. We can, we Israelis, I say to my friends, to, to politicians, whoever wants to hear, we are strong enough. We can go with our dreams and we can fulfill them if we believe in, this, uh, in these dreams. Otherwise, Otherwise, my children will not have peace. They will also go to the army and fight the way I did. Thank you very much. Thank you.